good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are located. I'd like to welcome you to our CCC OER webinar on faculty and librarians selecting high quality OER. My name is Regina Gong. I'm a librarian and OER project manager here at Lansing Community College in Michigan. Um, you are used to Una, Una Daily uh, moderating our CCC OER webinar. For today, I will be your moderator. While Una is with us, joining us in this webinar, we'll we're gonna give her a break. So, um, so welcome again. We have three of uh, my colleagues here in Michigan as um, our presenters, and you will be hearing um, from them in a little bit. And it's really nice to see a lot of folks um, introducing themselves in the chat window. So if you haven't introduced yourselves, please feel free to introduce um, yourselves. Okay, I am just going to advance to the next slide. Okay, so um, I just want to briefly go over our agenda for today. Um, we'll have introductions later. And then I'll do um, overview of um, what we do here at um, CCC OER. And then um, I will also briefly discuss about our um, statewide OER project here in Michigan through uh, the Michigan Colleges Online. And then we'll jump right into the presentation with um, Tina Ulrich and Elizabeth Sonnebin from um, Northern, Northwestern Michigan College. And then um, with Dr. Sharon Hughes from LCC. So, Let's go ahead and meet our presenters. Sharon, would you like to start and introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Sharon Hughes. I'm a professor of psychology at Lansing Community College and starting my 19th year there. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon. This is Sharon's first time to present um, for a CCC OER webinar. Um, Elizabeth, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. I'm Elizabeth Sonnebend. I'm adjunct faculty at Northwestern Michigan College, teaching marketing, uh, advertising, and professional communications. Thank you, Elizabeth. And last but not the least, Tina. Hi, um, I'm Tina Ulrich, and I'm the library director at Northwestern Michigan College. And I'm especially excited today to be here because these webinars with um, CCC OER and Una Daily is totally what got us started on um, OER. So it's really cool to be here presenting. Thank you, Una. Uh, thank you, Tina, sorry. Una, we really miss you here. <laughs> um, so um, for the CCC OER mission, our mission is actually, um, we are dedicated to promoting the adoption and development of OER to enhance teaching and learning. Um, most of you attend our webinar and really get a lot out of it. Um, you see um, in our um, new logo here that CCC OER is actually celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. And um, we'll talk more about that later um, in the webinar. So um, we have members in 25 um, US states, including British Columbia. We also have eight statewide consortiums. And as you know, even if you are not a member of CCC OER, all our webinars are open to all and we welcome you. So talking about um, CCC OER members, here in Michigan, we have three um, community colleges that are um, institutional members of OER, uh, of CCC OER. And we have one associate member, which is the Michigan Colleges Online. And I just want to briefly highlight that here in Michigan, we have an OER initiative that involves all 28 community colleges in the state, and it is called the MCO OER Initiative. Our goal is to improve student success, 
lower costs for students, and increase interinstitutional faculty collaboration. We actually have a steering committee that is represented by all the 28 community colleges in Michigan. We meet six to um, we meet every six to eight weeks, and we um, have lots of activities that support our initiative goals. In fact, we just finished um, a very successful MCO OER Summit last Friday, where we had Dr. Robin De Rosa as one of our keynote speaker. Um, and what we do here for community colleges in Michigan is that we have a repository which is hosted by OER Commons. And you can see the link up in the top. Um, MCO is actually a hub within um, OER Commons. We also have grants for faculty to um, adopt and accelerate OER adoption in their colleges. Um, like I mentioned, we provide training and professional development to faculty, librarians, instructional designers, and basically we are a statewide community of practice. So um, we have, as of fall, um, 14 colleges who are reporting because they have their own initiative, OER initiative in their colleges. And with just 14 colleges reporting, we have realized savings of over $3.1 million. So really this is, um, you know, very good for, for the state of Michigan in terms of OER adoption. So now let's go right into the presentation from um, Northwestern Michigan College. Tina and Elizabeth. We uh, how librarians can help and we're also going to, Elizabeth is going to share with you about how she set up her OER class. Um, so go ahead, Elizabeth. <laughs> if it will let me, I will. Let's see. Well, let's try yes, that again. Yeah, I already allowed you. Okay. There we go. Okay. So Northwestern Michigan College is a community college. Um, we are in Traverse City, Michigan, and we serve a large about uh, 3,200 FTE. All right. All right. Librarians help faculty find and choose OER and using OER in their courses. What's this got to do with you who, um, oh, sorry, is audio cutting out? How are we doing? Can we hear, can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you, but you were okay. Out. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, the, why why is OER part of the librarian? Well, we're committed to access for one thing. Librarians um, are all about getting information to people who need it, and that's always what we've done. Um, we know how to share. Um, and we're familiar with the publishing industry and we understand copyright and we know it's pitfalls. Right on. So, so <laughs> yeah, that's not like that. Okay. Uh, well, there we go. We, we'll do it <laughs> we have, whoops. Whoops. We have um, experience in... Um, Is it too loud? I'm sorry, I can't, the volume's not working. Okay. Audio. Elizabeth, just leave that slide there. That'll be fine. I'll finish up the other slide. Um, we have experience working with the content of college coursework. So um, some uh, subject specialists even have second master's degrees. Uh, we both work closely. We work closely with faculty and students. Um, we know how to find things and we know how to make sure other people can find things too. So what can librarians do to help faculty? Well, we can help identify the existing OER textbooks. 
um, we can search the repositories for you. Actual vetting of supplementary materials. Um, we can use our advanced search skills and experience to find exactly what you need. So, for example, you might say to your librarian, I need a short video on how cells divide. Um, and, and your librarian could go find you several open, um, available, really available um, videos that would suit your needs and you could choose. Um, we, we can also give you options for access and curation. Um, do you want to use the LMS? Do you want to use a LibGuide to present your material to your students? Um, where can you archive it? Can you make sure that, um, that the things that you're using are stable and will be available in the future? We can advise on issues of copyright and fair use, on the use of Creative Commons licenses, and um, we can also help articulate um, the principles, the guiding principles of the OER movement. So what can librarians, what, what can't we do? Well, not be completely knowledgeable in your subject area. Um, Librarians, the, the saying goes that a librarian's knowledge is a mile wide and an inch deep. Um, we, so we're not going to know everything about your subject area. Um, we can make the final call on the quality of a resource. Uh, you're going to have to do that. We can't choose your textbook for you. We cannot choose your pedagogical approach. And we would never interfere with your academic freedom. Okay, so the, um, the NMC librarians have helped many faculty adopt OER, and each faculty member is different, each class is different. Um, so I'm just going to give you a few examples of that. We had an abnormal psychology professor who wanted to, who wanted to use um, OER, and um, so he had an idea that he wanted his students to have a choice of using text materials that they could read, video materials, and audio materials. So can you advance this? There we go. Okay, so we made him a LibGuide, and we uh, I assigned two librarians to find these materials for him. We used a lot of NOBA. Um, we use some of the oak um, we used a fair number of government documents and we used some of the library subscription like films on demand to make this lip guide uh, the world cultures class um, the instructor was using Gardner's art um, art of Western, or I don't know which one, there are several of them, but it cost over a hundred dollars and he wasn't really using it all that much. Um, so uh, it was fairly easy to go out and find um, OER for this. Um, next slide. Uh, we ended up using um, a lot of the boundless art history and so we, uh, I could save a PDF of the, uh, a particular chapter and put it in these boxes on his LibGuide. Um, we used uh, a, world, a world history book from University of Georgia, and um, we supplemented with some Smithsonian materials and other um, freely available materials. This is an instructor who required um, a fair amount of help on this, so I did a lot of the work on this one. Um, this class actually hasn't taken place yet, but this is an example of instructors who um, aren't going to need a lot of help probably. Uh, so they, two instructors who are going to be teaching technical writing next semester. And um, so all I did was I did a exhaustive search of the OER repositories and found um, all of the technical writing OER textbooks. And I put them in a little box on the LibGuide. And um, there they are. And so these instructors will take a look at these, maybe cut and paste a little bit. 
Um, let's skip this one, Elizabeth, in the next. Okay, okay, and U.S. History, this instructor got a grant from MCO, um, the one that um, Regina mentioned, and um, she is taking the OpenStax history book and adding materials about that so that there's more Native American materials in it, and um, that one has been challenging. Um, I'm going to be looking at different platforms for that. This one was an introduction to college reading and writing, so it's a developmental English class. It was using a $120 textbook that just kept putting out new editions and going up and up, and the instructors were not comfortable. Is we took um, the, the different subjects that they taught, and um, we found like either chapters from an OER textbook or other things. Um, I put them into a spreadsheet, which is on the next slide. And all of these examples are just screenshots, but the links to the actual examples are going to be in the slides, so you can go back and look at them if you want to. So we created a spreadsheet um, with the topics covered in the class, and then um, I checked the licenses on the materials and made sure that um, they would have to, which ones they would have to just link to which ones had CC licenses, which ones that if they really wanted to use them, they would need to um, uh, ask permission. And lastly, um, principles of advertising, and this sigs nicely into um, Elizabeth's portion of the presentation. Okay. Um, so sometimes when I click, it goes to the next slide, and sometimes it doesn't, so bear with me. But um, I teach principles of advertising, as Tina said. Um, and uh, this is a libguide she helped me um, work on and create that gives my students um, different uh, resources for the class, for an assignment, and um, examples of advertising as well. Okay, so um, I chose to use OER for several reasons. Uh, first one being I have a college student too, so um, I know what that book bill is like at the end of a or beginning of a semester. Um, this semester for my niece, it wasn't too bad, but um, last semester it was like $400. The other thing I really felt about using OER was I'm in an industry where you can learn a lot just by doing research yourself. And I felt like using OER resources would teach the students how to learn. My field also changes rapidly. So um, I, uh, and it's just going forward without me. Um, <laughs> well, sorry about that. It's going backwards. Let's try this again. Um, so, an advertising textbook especially is pretty much out of date the minute it prints. Um, with social media and all of the technology coming into play and all the digital stuff coming into the world, you can't keep a marketing or an advertising textbook up to date once it's printed. Um, and then I also like my online classes to be fully online so that it can be taken anywhere from, uh, anywhere that a student can connect from. I've actually had students in the Coast Guard and they've taken the class from the ship. So they've not even been on land when they were taking the class. Um, so that definitely is you know, an advantage of using materials that I'll say need as an internet connection for. I managed to switch through a pilot program with um, a librarian support, Tina support, and uh, educational media technology support as well. I research free textbooks and resources. Tina showed me a lot of, you know, I knew some, but Tina showed me a lot that I had never seen before that were great resources for assignments and articles and videos and all of that stuff. 
I also use the school's access to trade publications because, you know, everything's changing so fast in this industry that trade publications are one of the best ways to stay up to date. I added in a lot of video resources, um, some that's free on the web, uh, some stuff from PBS and their learning media section, and videos from our library. So, um, and then I also found sites where instructors share lessons. That was a big help too. That's something I started when I first started teaching and it's always been really super helpful. Uh, I'm using a LibGuide, so this offers me a way to offer the resources a textbook, textbook would traditionally offer, um, linking to things like, you know, the Super Bowl ads from every year and different print ads and award-winning ads that have uh, been out there and resources for researching for the assignments. I also use uh, some professional resources from professional organizations. So as a member of like the American Advertising Federation and American Marketing Association, they have classroom resources for instructors that are free to use if you're a member um, and they're a great resource. One of the pros of using OER for me is that I can use this online textbook to provide basic concepts while I can pull from non-traditional resources. So I use um, things like Google's AdWords class that's free online for anybody who wants to learn how to use Google AdWords rather than giving them a lesson, you know, in digital advertising that's gonna change the minute I write it by using their materials, I'm keeping the students up to date and they come out of the class knowing what's the latest and the greatest in that field. Um, obviously a pro is saving them money when I was looking, I was gonna have to replace a textbook regardless. So, um, you know, I looked at the prices of the textbooks and thought, man, I really don't want to do that to students. There's not going to be a used version, and that's going to be a lot of money to shell out. Um, it also kind of forced me out of the box. I had to come up with lesson plans that were different. Uh, my marketing class, which is still a traditional text, is very much case study discussion, case study discussion. This, I was able to do some stuff to adapt to different learning styles, to sort of offer that same thing that the psychology professor does where you can do a read, view, or listen. Um, I try to do that every week. Um, and I try to pull in some fun stuff. So I'll link them to, you know, John Oliver's rant on native advertising, but I'll also link them to the PBS um, discussion round table on native ads. Um, and, you know, they're two very different approaches to it, but um, they give students two different views. As far as cons, I really don't have a lot of um, cons to using it. I think most of them can e be easily overcome, especially when you reach out to you know, librarians and media technology and people that have done it before. Um, you usually can find a solution. You do have to keep your resources and links up to date because I'm in a field that changes a lot and because I'm linking students to samples of like Super Bowl ads and stuff like that. Um, I have to update that pretty much every semester um, and then have to double check it, usually a week or two before the assignment. Some students are more comfortable with the textbook. Um, for those students, I've offered them ways to either buy it or get it printed so that they have a paper version in front of them. And then uh, free textbooks often lack assignments and case studies. That's one of the reasons my marketing class hasn't converted yet is because in order to convert the class, we've got to rewrite all of the assignments. Um, there's a great book but it doesn't have great assignments in it, so. As far as what I would do differently, um, my work, homework assignments are still really writing heavy, um, and I kind of feel like in a class with a creative topic that I could expand on that more, so I'm working on that. Um, I'd write more content myself. The book I found is pretty good, uh, but it doesn't address some of the newer concepts and you know, changes that the industry has had in the last few years. And then I'd also use more industry articles than I do, um, you know, just try to keep them constantly reading up-to-date information on the topic. Okay, thank you.
and Tina. Um, if you have any questions for the two of our speakers, you may just type it in the chat box and we'll try to address them later on in the presentation. Um, so Sharon. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, I am just approving it. Okay. Hopefully you can advance now. Uh, no. It's not letting me move the... Oh. Okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm a psychology professor at Lansing Community College, which is located in downtown Lansing, uh, founded in 1957. It's the third largest community college in Michigan, and we serve students in both credit and non-credit courses. We offer more than 230 associate degree and certificate programs. Uh, we're a big college encompassing a service area of six counties and have about 26,000 students a year, although it's down a little bit this fall. Uh, the college uh, LCC was the first college to offer online degree programs and we now have more than 250 courses online and 26 associate degrees and certificates that can be earned through online study. The psychology program is one of the largest programs on campus. We have offer a variety of courses, 12 courses, in a variety of formats, face-to-face, -face, online, hybrid, um, all the times, 8, 10 to 10, 10 or 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., uh, Monday through Saturday, in all, all our locations. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five locations. We also offer sections at three area high schools for advanced high school students. Psychology 200 is, whoops. Psychology 200 is the largest uh, course on campus, uh, the largest course we offer. It's the most popular, one of the most popular courses on campus. And we re routinely over, uh, re enroll over 2,000 students a year. And this semester we have 35 sections of intro, uh, 1,028 students enrolled. Now those, what we've done in the past is we have about uh, 20, three different faculty who um, teach intro to psych. And we had, a, we had five different textbooks that faculty could choose from. Um, but we were running into problems with having a choice, having that different choice. Um, some difficulties when sections got switched, um, faculty wouldn't be able to use their own textbook. They had to use the textbook that was assigned to that section and that was becoming very problematic. And also the textbook that, one of the textbooks that we were using was going to a new edition. It was gonna cost close to 600, or close to $200. Uh, the bookstore wasn't able to order the older editions. We, we had in the past tried to keep costs down for students by uh, using older editions, but the, the bookstore wasn't able to do that anymore. So um, for all these reasons, we decided it was time for a change and since we were oops, since we were changing anyway and going to a common textbook, we decided to switch to an OER. I'm not able to advance the slide. There we go. Um, so we decided to switch uh, to an OER. Um, and it just so happened, uh, could you, uh, do you want me to advance? Okay. Yep, I, I don't know what's, uh, I can't control it anymore. Okay. Um, so at that time, we uh, were decided to go with a common textbook. Uh, Regina brought me a copy of the OpenStax textbook and um, thought that it might be a good choice. So uh, it, it was our first um, introduction kind of to an OER. Uh, so we found actually a few resources out there, uh, OpenStax being one, a couple of other traditional textbooks, um, the NOVA project. Uh, so there's actually quite a few out there. Some were more collections of articles, more modular or resources where pac faculty can pick and choose the material. And that's, that's good, we like to be able to pick and choose, but given the fact that we have 27 different faculty, many are adjuncts, um, 
a lot of them were teaching for their first time. We really didn't want to put the burden of developing their own materials onto faculty who are already underpaid and overworked. So we thought a traditional type textbook would work best for us. So we found several that fit that criteria. Could you advance the slide, please? Um, and what we did next was as a as a group, the psychology program developed a rubric which looked at, uh, when we, we thought of all the things that we, we wanted our textbook to have. Did it meet our learning outcomes? Is it available in a variety of formats? Uh, ancillary materials, um, student support, formative assessments. Uh, does it have the classic studies? All of that stuff. Uh, so we developed the rubric and then um, we <clears throat> asked for volunteers, um, psychology volunteers, and each volunteer was given two or three chapter or topic areas, their area of expertise, <clears throat> and each uh, volunteer reviewed the same chapter or topic areas for all five OERs that we were reviewing. And we had two reviewers for each chapter or topic area. Um, I tallied up the results, and we had a meeting to discuss it, and the consensus was uh, to go with the OpenStax textbook. So could you uh, click this? There we go. Um, it's, it, students can get a traditional hard copy if they want through Amazon for $36.50, I think. Uh, we also here on campus printed it out uh, and put it in three ring binders for students to purchase for $24. And some of them did take advantage of that. So some of the things, some of the challenges um, that we had were changing Changing in general, uh, a lot of work to um, rework classroom materials, assignments, exams. Um, so that was that is challenging in general. Some faculty actually weren't enthusiastic. Um, maybe due to inertia, they've been using the same textbook for 20 years. Uh, concerns about the quality. Um, some actually were concerned that students might not think the quality of a free textbook is very good, so they might not uh, value it very much. Another switch, uh, another thing which was difficult about the switch was uh, hard copies for faculty. All our, every single uh, faculty member wanted a hard copy. They didn't want to read it online. So usually the publisher gives us uh, hard copies of their textbook, but uh, OpenStax wasn't able to do that. Uh, but fortunately, our associate dean uh, stepped in and agreed to purchase hard copies for all the faculty. So that, that was very helpful. At the end of the semester, we evaluated um, both students' perceptions and faculty perceptions. And faculty's perceptions of uh, impact on their teaching, uh, pretty neutral to, to positive. Uh, the, the most positive thing was it allowed them to uh, better accommodate diverse student needs. Because uh, as I said, the textbook was, one of the textbooks was over $200. Um, Faculty were not as enthusiastic about the quality of the OER, uh, the quality of the textbooks, although students were more than happy with the quality of the textbooks, so that was uh, us, perhaps. And the ancillary materials also um, didn't seem to be as positive um, and as the, the, the ones we purchase. Students, however, uh, they were very enthusiastic about the use of OERs. Uh, before I get there, um, the one of the challenges that uh, of using an OER that faculty were most concerned with was finding high quality resources, up to date resources, having the time to look for them, and the time and the con uh, compensation to evaluate them was kind of the consensus there. And this is where librarians and uh, Regina, in particular, on our campus is playing a pivotal role. Um, she's great about finding resources. Uh, curating them, uh, letting us know what's out there, uh, pushing faculty to uh, think outside the box and, and uh, that adopt uh, OERs, look for OERs and adopt OERs. And our college as a whole, our college administration has also uh, very much committed to this. And I think Regina is going to talk about that a little bit later uh, about what the president's doing to um, um, help faculty adopt OERs. So in terms of student, Six students' uh, perceptions, like, we, like I said, while all faculty were concerned about the quality, students thought it was the same or even better. <laughs> Only 4% uh, thought that it was worse than textbooks in their other classes. So students were very happy with it. 
Um, 84% uh, said they'd be uh, likely or very likely to enroll in a course that used an OER, uh, probably because 75% reported spending no money for the class materials. Um, and again, others printed it off uh, for 20, as little as $24. So there is that hard copy available for those students. Uh, we also had uh, open-ended questions on our evaluation and students, uh, Students really like it. Uh, they really like uh, the use of OERs. Um, everybody has access, it levels the playing field. Uh, I've always been bitter about buying a textbook where I read two or three pages. Um, and $150 for a, one textbook for one class is, a lot of students just can't afford it. A lot of them just don't buy the textbook. So free textbooks are really helping as well. So. So overall, <clears throat> the total textbook savings for our students in, um, since fall 2015 to fall 2017 is over a million dollars. Um, as of fall 2017, this fall, we have 74 faculty using OERs in 27 courses, uh, representing 150 sections. So we've got um, a lot of faculty are on board. And What's happening on our col at the college level is um, the president has um, designated $500,000 to help faculty, give them those resources, give them the time to research and adopt OERs. So this is a, a wonderful thing that the president's done. So it's good to give faculty some time, some money to uh, go out and look for good resources with the help of uh, Regina and hopefully find some OERs that are appropriate for their courses. We are working in psychology towards a Z degree uh, where students can get a an associate's degree in psychology without having to purchase a textbook. Uh, so far, we're starting with the courses um, our psychology courses and the five that are required for the AA degree. And uh, right now, four out of the five are now using um, OERs. Uh, the fifth one, abnormal psychology, we're still looking to find one for that. Uh, so hopefully, um, within the next few years uh, in psychology, students will be able to get a psychology degree. Yeah, and um, thank you, Sharon. And in addition to that, um, for our road ahead, um, I was fortunate to be chosen as one of the Open Education Research um, Fellows for 2017-2018. And part of the work that we're going to do is to assess the efficacy of OER adoption using the COOP framework, which is cost, outcome, usage, and perception. And um, based from the preliminary um, data that I have, I see that the grades of our students who are taking um, OER um, in their courses are the same or better as, you know, if you compare them with um, the class um, that uses a traditional textbook prior to the move. So it really is very gratifying to see that it is affecting student success. Um, and of course, one of the things that we want to do too is to make um, it easy for our students to discover these classes when they do um, register. And so um, perhaps we'll be um, having that OER designation in our student registration system. We're working with our IT folks to be able to do that. Okay, so I see there's really a good discussion with, um, you know, providing OER in a LibGuide environment versus an LMS. I see a lot of discussions in the chat box. Keep it going. So um, just to, um, you know, give you a heads up of our upcoming um, conferences where CCC OER will be there. Um, Open Ed 2017 is coming up. It will be at Anaheim. Um, October 11 to 13. Um, I'll be there and I hope to see a lot of you um, there. It's, you know, it's the 
ultimate open ed gathering of all um, open education practitioners. So um, I hope I hope someday you know you can you can come if not um, in this um, year's um, conference. And also because CCCOER is part of the um, Open Education Consortium, um, we have the OE Global 2018. I believe that would be in April. Proposals are still being accepted, and it will be due October. October 23rd. And if you go to the cccoer.org um, website, there's a um, tab there that says get involved. You'll see a lot of those um, events um, listed. And of course, um, stay in touch through our community email. Um, the, the link is here. You know, sign up. I think as of now, we have about 600 people um, in our um, CCCOER listserv. It really is very helpful, especially if you are just starting um, with your OER um, project in your colleges. And our next webinar will be on October 25. That will be um, coinciding with the celebration of um, Open Access Week. We will have um, a series called Open in Order to Share and how open access rep repositories support institutional OER adoption. And if you want to contact any of us, our email is here and you can also follow us via Twitter. Um, if you have any questions, you can, you can ask them now. Okay, let, let me just take a look at. Okay, um, Serge is asking, has anyone else experienced a delay in gaining access to the CCCOER listserv? Um, Regina, this is Una, I'll take that oh, okay. one. Hi, Serge. Okay. This is Una. Um, I do have one of my executive board manages that listserv um, and uh, so if you've experienced a delay, you can contact us directly. However, what really helps us to get people on the list quickly is if you apply with your college email address. So if you apply with a Gmail address and with, uh, we don't really know who you are. And because this is a community of practice reserved for educators, we, we really want to make sure that this is about education and it doesn't become a sales channel. So if you can apply with your college email address we, and your complete name, um, we can, we can um, add you very quickly. Otherwise, we need to send out an email to you and find out um, a little bit more about you. So that might be why you're experiencing a delay. Thanks for asking that. Yeah, we have a question here um, from Cynthia um, about librarians curating um, OERs and how do we define curation in relation to OER. Um, I'll, I'll answer that first, um, Cynthia. When, when we say curating OER, it's, it's mostly the discovery. So finding um, what OERs are being used across um, other community colleges. Um, and that's where uh, the, the CCCOER listserv would really come in handy because the listserv really um, gives a lot of information regarding um, adoptions by other colleges. And um, yeah, basically just, you know, finding all the different um, resources that a faculty might be able to use for the courses. And Tina has something to add to. Tina? Um, I think I might be the one who talked about curating. Um, I, what, what I have found is that sometimes um, you will find a, a, like a video or, um, well, it, let me just use the case of the of the, um, the one lib guide that I made for the world cultures class. I wanted to take one chapter of a um, OER textbook and I just wanted that one chapter. 
the teacher didn't want students to think they had to read 80 pages. They just wanted that one chapter. And so um, I was able to take that out. And um, so I could put it in Google Docs where both the instructor and I could get to it. I could put it in the LibGuide. And um, so sometimes I save things, like I will save a download of video um, that's downloadable and save it and um, and keep it in either on the, you know, the school's share drive or in Google Docs or someplace where I know it's going to stay and it's not going to, you know, change or disappear or the link break or something like that. Um, it's, it's not a huge problem, but until it arises and then it's a huge problem. So that's what I meant by curating. And I think uh, Maud here, Tina, is asking about um, how did you find finding to be funding to get started? Okay, we got, we had an internal grant of $5,000 from our foundation, and it was called an innovation grant. Um, and that's what we used. We offered 10 faculty members, 5,000, or we had, um, to, to adapt one of their courses to OER. Um, and that was great. It was very successful. It kickstarted things in, and we, we got going. Um, but it, that was all, <laughs> that's all there was. And I haven't been able to find funding, um, anywhere else. Uh, so, uh, that's, that could be a start. If you could find, uh, like a, a, a innovation grant or a foundation grant or something like that doesn't take much five thousand dollars yeah for our case here um here at lcc we didn't start um when we started with our oer initiative we didn't have any funding so we relied on our faculty's desire to save their students money so um it was only actually um, this semester when, you know, we have already saved more than a million dollars since fall 2015 and we've been gaining a lot of um, publicity um, statewide that our administration decided to really amp it up and scale it um, by providing half a million dollars um, for, for faculty um, incentives and awards. Um, towards adopting and creating OER. So it can be done even without or with little funding. So, um, Karen has a question about predatory publishing and how this relates to OER. Okay, so is there anyone who wants to answer that? I think, Predatory publishing, it more is with um, the open access journals. Um, OER really, um, in my, you know, in the experience that I have working with OER, since OER have open licenses, um, it allows everyone to use it, whether it's for commercial purposes, for whatever purpose that they want it to, to be used, which is really good because of the open licenses inherent to OER. So. Anyone else have a question? Oh, Claudia, yes, actually there is. Um, I just forgot the title, but if you go to SUNY OER, um, they have a uh, and we are there specifically for um, information literacy and research. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's there. I just have to take a look at the, the, yes, Alexis, thank you. Yeah, I remember that because I've, I've, 
you know, I've, I've read it and I've downloaded it. So thank you, Alexis. Oh, and Virginia Tech also has one. And Maud also has a question. Okay, how did you promote the idea of OER to faculty? Um, okay, I can speak for what I did here at LCC. Really, you have to frame it towards what, what is the problem you're really trying to solve. So before we um, embark on this OER initiative, we had a preliminary um, survey of our students. You know, are you buying textbook? How much did you pay for a textbook? And our students were not buying textbook and they are spending a lot of money, um, you know, for, for textbooks. And so um, we really framed it in a way that would help our students be successful, providing them with access to learning materials from day one of the class. And a lot of our, our faculty really buy into that um, access and social justice issue. And of course, it helped too that um, we flew in a lot of speakers, um, David Wiley, Nick. Um, Nicole Allen, Nicole Finkbeiner, Una came to LCC, and a lot of our faculty really became inspired. And Regina is very persuasive, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was told that they can't refuse me, so. <laughs> <laughs> and once in the psychology program, once um, faculty are very committed to students, and once we started with, with intro and, and we got the entire 35 courses using intro, uh, using the textbook, uh, using the o OER, um, it kind of caught on and people thought, well, you know, this can be done and this is a good thing. Um, so it's expanded. Psychology is part of the social science program and so it's kind of expanded into um, other social science, sociology, um, humanities courses, history. So it's it's spreading and it's a good, a good spread. Um, I'd like to add something here. Um, I think that that uh, th there are lots of ways to promote this to faculty. We've certainly used our professional development day. Um, we, if I find if there's announced that there's a new OER textbook for a particular course, I will um, email uh, the faculty members in that field and let them know that. Um, but you, we, we can't assume that. Um, faculty love the textbooks that they have. They don't. They don't love them. In fact, I don't think faculty, um, <laughs> you know, they, they, they want to do um, a lot of different things. They're very creative people. And so this is, you can, you can certainly promote it as um, freedom, of academic freedom, too. Um, Mark DeLong is re wanting me to tell you this. <laughs> this semester we um, we got uh, lunch bags, uh, brown paper bags, and put some pen, a pen, a button, um, some sticky notes that had our OER logo on it, and an apple. And then we went and got some really good cookies from a local bakery. And we delivered these little lunch bags to all of the teachers who are teaching with open textbooks this semester. And either delivered them to the offices or we put them in their mailboxes. Um, and they had a big sticker on it that said, Thank you for saving NMC $167,000 this semester. Um, that, that's a lot of lunches that they could buy instead of buying a textbook. So things like that, they work, they're fun. I also want to get the ed tech people in your in your school. Um, they are your natural allies. They are the people who who know about online learning and who know how to make technology do the things they want it to do. Um, so they um, 
if you're if you're trying to put together an OER team, um, don't forget those ed tech people. They're crucial to this operation. Okay, Karen asks, what resistance have you encountered to using OER, if any? Um, most of the most of the pushback that I hear is the time involved. Because while OERs are free, it's really not free for faculty to adopt it. You know, it's it's essentially a course redesign, um, combining, especially if you're combining multiple um, OERs um, together. So uh, that that was the the biggest complaint that I get from our faculty that they want to be compensated for the time that they put in um, creating a course using OER. And that's what um, we've done, um, you know, with the uh, grant or the faculty award that we are now making available for our faculty to get paid. So yeah, it's it really is the time element plus um, you know it's it doesn't look it doesn't act like a textbook you know you you have to to consult a number of OER to come up with with a good one whereas when you use a textbook everything is there you know powerpoints quizzes assessments so yeah I mean Elizabeth and and um, Sharon, maybe you can um, speak to, to um, this too, being a faculty. Actually, Elizabeth had to leave because oh, okay. she, she's doing this from her, uh, from her day job. Oh. Um, <laughs> Bye, <and> Elizabeth. <laughs> she, she had a three o'clock meeting, but it's, that's a perfect example. And, um, but there are always faculty creative and hardworking faculty who are willing to do it, even if they're not being compensated. Yes. That, was the, that was the biggest pushback in the psychology program is it's going to, it's going to be a lot of work to, to change textbooks. Um, but OpenStax did have some ancillary materials, a test bank, instructor resources, uh, PowerPoint slides. So that, that was helpful. And the money helped too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And actually, um, our college, um, several people have taken sabbaticals. And on their sabbaticals, yes. they've developed OER. Uh, they've written textbooks, written their own textbook, written their own materials, or pulled together OER materials that were already out there. So we've also yeah. gotten time to do it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Alice. Um, thank you, Sharon. Yes, um, a number of our full-time faculty also got, um, you know, took a sabbatical just to write um, an OER. So we have um, three already, um, I know we are written by faculty and um, there's two more um, coming as a result of a sabbatical this um, semester. Well, we're, we're almost at the top of the hour and um, Really, really enjoyed doing this um, webinar with you. If you have any more question to um, Tina or myself, just feel free to send us an email. We'd like to thank Elizabeth and Sharon for doing it, doing it with us too. Um, and I hope you get as much as you know as much information as um, you were expecting from this webinar. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, and see if you're attending open ed um, in two weeks. Um, I'll see you there. <laughs>